Hey friends, Tyler Patner here. Special video today for you. I am joined by the head man in charge at Air Force Air Guns and Raw uh, Rapid Air Works, John McCaslin. Uh, John, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, John's a really interesting guy. Most of you probably don't know that because he's quite reserved. I think that's a fair thing to say. Stoic? Oh, I don't... Uh tend to put myself in the public eye too often. Yeah, so obviously I like making people uncomfortable, so we put a microphone on and we're gonna talk all yeah. things air guns. So here we, we go. We're gonna have a good time. All right, let's jump right in. John, how'd yes. you get into air guns? How'd I get into air guns? I got into air guns as a teenager. I was actually into firearms as a teenager. And when I used to go to gun shows, uh, the friends I made there, uh, one of them, uh, out, of the, out of the people I met, one of them became a really good friend and he collected air guns. And I messed around with air guns somewhat, but I wasn't that interested in them. I was more into the cool factor of, of firearms and things like that. But he got me, he got me interested in it, got me, uh, motivated to, to start collecting air guns and learning about air guns. And the next thing I knew, I was into firearms and air guns. What, what was the air gun that got you started, if there was one? There really wasn't. Actually, what, what got me started, I really wasn't interested in any specific air guns. I guess it was the backyard, shooting in the backyard, being able to shoot and not have to go to a gun range is what got me interested in them, but the thing is that I was into machine guns. And I lived in Illinois, and you couldn't own machine guns Not in good. Illinois. Yes. So what really got me going in the, in the air gun direction is like, of course, my interest in machine guns was just as a hobby and as a novelty thing. So I was thinking at, at one point, since this guy got me kind of interested in air guns, it's like, well, you know, I could, maybe I should design an air machine gun, you know? And I went off on this tangent, several year tangent, you know, to design air machine guns. And it started as a teenager, carried in through my time in the military, carried through college, carried through to being a government agent, I actually started going to the SHOT Show because I was so con so convinced I was going to build this air machine gun thing sure. that I needed to know how to sell it. And then I went off on a, uh, or I actually started making prototypes in the garage. Okay. And after two or three years of like going to the SHOT Show to meet people and see how the industry worked, uh, on my vacation time, because at that point in time, I was a federal agent. Yeah. And I, I met this guy that was a uh, wholesaler in England at the SHOT Show, and we became friends. So he came to the SHOT Show one year with this kind of cobbled up air gun thing okay. that some guy was making in the back shop, you know, his back shed in, in England. He said, you know, this guy is making this gun. It was uh, like this funny looking single shot gun with this big tank. The gun was only this long and the tank was as long as the gun. And it was threaded for a silencer because it was from England, you know, and that's what they did yep. over there. He brought this thing in and of course I'd been telling him, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna design this BB machine gun for, you know, as a novelty thing that's gonna be fun to play with. And he was telling me, you know, this guy's making these in this shed in England and every time he makes, and I'm selling them, and he makes a couple and I'll sell them. And then he makes a couple more and I'll sell them. But every time he makes two or three of them, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things back in that like time frame, right? He like keeps, 80s, 90s? He keeps improving on it, yeah. you know, because he's building them two or three at a time. And it's like, oh, I could make this better if I change this. And then he builds two or three more. And he said, you know, if I could get enough of these things, I could sell a lot of these because the, people really like this concept. And I, of course, I'm like, oh, well, I'm designing an air machine gun. 
this is just a single shot rifle. Right. This is easy. This is like, how hard can this be? Right. You know, because I'm flipping it around, and it's like, oh yeah. It's a, and at that point in time, that thing, it only had like three or four moving parts. Okay. You know, it, it when you when you cocked it, you pushed the barrel forward. Not not the bolt, the, yeah. the barrel physically forward, moved, physically yeah. moved, and then hooked on the trigger. Okay. You know, so the trigger pivoted. And then you would pull the trigger, and the whole barrel would slam, slam back, back into the valve. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, that's that's dirt simple. Yeah, right. At the end of that four-day shot show, I was I, I said basically, and much to my chagrin today, I said, he said, you know, if I could get a lot of those, I could sell I could sell a bunch of them. And I said, well, I could I could make this. this sure. Is it. I could make this. This is simple, you know? And he said, well, why don't you? And I said, okay, I will. <laughs> the start of all great ideas. And that was the start of it right there. That's how it started. And then I spent within six weeks, I had a prototype. That's Mocked quick. up a prototype. That's quick. Because I'd had this little lathe and mill set up in my garage. So you did it all by hand. So I did it all myself, fabricated this prototype. And it fired, and it had the slam barrel thing in it, you know, and we ended up taking that to Iwa. Okay. So for those that don't know, SHOT Show is uh, the big U.S. trade show for the gun industry, outdoors industry. Mm -hmm. Iwa is the equivalent for Europe. Uh, and probably in the air gun space, a lot bigger than SHOT Show is for air guns. Fair statement. Oh yeah, the yeah. Iwa is probably one third the size of the SHOT Show. Right. But there's probably 15, more, 15 times more air gun related things yeah. there than there is at SHOT Show. Yes. You know, so it's big, big into air guns there. So you take this thing to Iwa. Yeah, we took it to Iwa, we showed it, got some interest, okay. And that was the start, you know, that, that, what's got it, that got us started. And then it turned into a three year project of refinement, you know, and we hauled that thing to the SHOT Show for three years after that. It turned out to be a little bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> sure. Because it, it, it had to be, it had to be accurate. It had to be reliable. It, it, you know, no one had ever built a design like that before, so there was a lot of playing around with it, trying to get the valving system working properly, working consistently. Uh, but the thing is, it did, for its size, it, it performed better than just about anything else on the marketplace at the time. Now, because you were designing this for a guy in the UK, mm -hmm. sub 12 foot pound gun? Like relatively low power. The bike. idea at that point in time, yeah, initially it was a twelve foot pound gun, okay. and the idea was, you know, we we had this thing of like, well, he wanted to sell them, and I was intrigued with building them, so I was like, well, I'll build them and you sell them, and it'll be an English product, but we're gonna, it'll be made in the United States, you know, and the, and we proceeded forward on that note, and. In 1990, I started this about 93, 94, okay. started it. And then by about 1997, everybody was saying, this thing will never make it to the marketplace. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is vaporware. This is never going to show up. We've never seen that in the air gun industry ever before, ever. <laughs> I'm sure it was a fluke. Yeah. <laughs> no, but about the time people were saying, nope. You know, that's never going to see the light of day. We, sh we shipped the first shipment to England in December of 97. Okay. And that's what got it all rolling. And then, you know, small shipment in December, probably three or four months later, another shipment. And then around mid to late 1998, I thought, well, the, the market for this thing is in England. This is not a U.S. product, but since I'm here, I might as well offer it here. I might as well see if I can sell some of them in the United States. And that's when it, we came out with uh, Air Force. And actually there was, 
there was a company, he, there was another Air Force in England. Okay, so that's why it was gunpowder in There England. was Air, Air Force existed as a, as a small company that made silencers in England oh, okay. at that time. And Jeff came up with gunpowder as his name to sell it under in Europe, sure. in England. But I liked the name Air Force. And I thought, well, that Air Force is in England and I'm in the U.S., so I'm going to call good. my company Air Force because right. I like that name. Sure. So that's where Air Force came from. Okay, so then you start making some higher power guns, which you started with tech, what is now a Talon. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think the Condor was next. Yeah. And then probably Talon SS okay. after the Condor. All right, and then the rest is kind of history. And then moving a few years forward, so like 2016, 17, you come out with the Texan. Like the first iteration of the Texan, I believe, was 17. Sounds about right. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, that's, sounds that's, about that's right. right. Um, which at the time, monster big bore, like two, 300 foot pounds was kind of the max at that point. And then you come out with this 500 foot pound at behemoth. At that point in time, yeah, they're, they're the, a big bore, a uh, commercially available yes. gun, uh, air gun, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing out there was 200 and something foot pounds. Yeah, like 230, 240. Something yeah. like that. You know, the thing is what a lot of people don't know <clears throat> is that there were some small custom custom guys yep. that were making four or five hundred foot pound guns. Absolutely. Yep. So it's not like they didn't exist. I just commercialized it. Yeah, like Dennis Quackenbush is the big one. Yeah, that everybody yeah. References. Quack, Dennis Quackenbush yeah. had been around for a while. Yeah. And and I knew Dennis, and uh, in fact, I know Dennis. Mm -hmm. He's a friend of mine. Uh, and I thought, well, heck, if they can, it's like. Well, I guess my thought pattern was, and what we'd been seeing is <clears throat> that there was a lot of interest in 25 caliber because it was more powerful. And then suddenly 30 caliber pellets started showing up and people thought, oh yeah, this is great. I get more power out of 30. And there started to be this move, incremental move bigger every year. And when I started working on the, uh, the Texan, 357 pellets were just coming out. And that was what was driving the energy capabilities at that point in time, was that 357 pellet. And they were in the 200 and some grain, uh, or 200 and some foot pound category. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of thought, well, why all this little incremental stuff? <laughs> let's leapfrog. Let's just leapfrog everybody with a 500 foot pound gun. The 457 Texan at that 500 foot pound mark at the time just like blows past everything. Yes, everybody immediately said that, that we were liars and you couldn't get 500 foot pounds out of an air gun. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, so you prove everybody wrong <clears throat> and then obviously over the next uh, probably five, six years up until now, right? Mm -hmm. you, you incrementally improve upon that with, you know, carbon bottle, TX2 valve, uh, you know, you come out with some short versions, suppressed versions. So yeah, improve, incremental improvements. Yeah, there there. so, so you, you kind of differentiate the line. You've got five different calibers in the Texan now, I believe, yeah. four or five. Um, so, you, so you've done a, a really great job of building that line, but I think at the back of everybody's mind, there's like, oh, well, Air Force has this, this basically what amounts to a similar design for all their guns, right? When are we, when are we gonna get a multi-shot? And you gave everybody the answer to this in probably the most unexpected way possible. Uh, and that was 2018? That was uh, January 2018 SHOT Show. Yeah. And that was RAW. That was RAW. So Air Force acquires we RAW. acquired RAW. From Martin Rutherford, yeah. um, uh, from Theoban fame. So you got, and now you have this multi-shot platform that is a tank, uh, you know, obviously a, a great reputation for a long, long time. Um, what changed when you took that on in terms of, there, there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, I need a, I need a pre-Air Force RAW. And, and I think people have a misconception about what may have or may have not changed when you guys acquired RAW. When so we let's acquired set the record RAW, straight. <clears throat> excuse me. When we acquired RAW, at first, nothing changed. And slowly, we started bringing components in house. We started we and we started off with the the more complex 
uh, turned components, the valving, the valve parts and, and things like that, uh, we started bringing those in-house because we had equipment that was better suited for it than he did. So we would build, we kept building more and more of the parts and then we would ship him the parts and he would assemble the guns. So Martin was still literally hands-on involved yeah. in every gun that went out the door. Yeah, for like the first year or two, we just kept building more and more of the parts, but he, everything went to him to put together. And my understanding is he still today has, has a hand in pretty yep. much every gun that goes out the door. Yep. Yeah, so uh, for all of you out there that are naysayers, it, it, he's still very much involved, and, and that is a thing, so um, shut your mouths. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when we, obviously with Raw, you know, there was, I, I remember that in 2018, there was originally, like, you had some Theobin guns there, and, and I know, you know, you've gone a different direction with, like, the chassis. That obviously wasn't really a thing uh, when the acquisition happened. Yeah, um, came later. And, and a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2020 maybe, um, you, you teased this little rinky-dink raw. And the mini, you, or the yes, micro. Yes, the micro. The micro. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, we haven't, well, I can, can I? The can, micro gun. Can I tell them I've seen it? Is that okay? Well, we had it at the SHOT Show. I know, but can I tell them it's real? Oh. <laughs> sure. So like they've got this micro raw that vaporware, rug oh, yeah, pull, the vaporware, whole yeah. thing. I've seen it. I've shot it. It's real. Yep. Just it's coming. We have 125 receivers waiting to be put together. The pro what has slowed us down or slowed us down on the micro is that we can't keep up with uh, HMX 1000X production. You know, it's. It's one of those things that, that, that as we ramp up availability on RAWs, we don't do anything that might denigrate the quality level. And it's, it's, it's agonizing for us because we're a production company and we want to get the volume out. We want to get guns out to everybody that wants one. Yeah. But we can only get them out so fast because they still all go through, through uh, Martin. Sure. And we are slowly ramping the numbers up, slowly get, uh, increasing the quantity, quantity levels. We are transitioning from just sending him parts to now we're starting, you know, after he has showed us what he wants, now we're doing sub-assemblies, you know. So now we're putting together triggers. Right. Now we're putting together regulators. But they still all go back to Tennessee. For that final assembly. For the final assembly yeah. and the final checkout yep. to make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. So slowly our numbers go up, uh, but it's still gonna take a while before we get into, you know, really uh, what I call good, good numbers. Sure, and these things take time. I mean, it's not, and you, you can't just turn it on like a faucet. It doesn't work that way. It, it, we're trying to, turn an almost custom hand-built gun into a production hand-built gun and without compromising without any compromising of the any capabilities yeah. without compromising any uh, of the uh, performance characteristics or anything like that and that is not simple you know yeah. it's 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 not simple to build because nobody else builds air guns like that in the United States you know, as a product, as a right, there are boutique at things. Quantities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, every there's just a couple boutique guys out there, and we're trying to take boutique mainstream. Yep. So, so we gotten a glimpse into you know what's coming for raw, um, but on the Air Force side of things, you know, I'm assuming uh, 800 foot pounds is not where the bar is going to be set for long. So, I'm assuming you guys are already either developing or you, know, you don't have to confirm or deny, but I'm, I'm assuming there might be some pushing of that, that power boundary. But, but is that all we're going to see? No, the, 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 power, the power where we're at is probably not the power levels where we will always stay. If we're going to do a high powered gun, it needs to have a use. It needs to have a purpose. Sure. But right now we're switching. We're, we're switching gears back to a project we started back before Big Board. 
Okay. So uh, the arrow guns, you know, <laughs> that are out on the marketplace now, we actually had developed an arrow gun before any of those ever hit the market. Okay. But we laid the arrow gun project to the side because we thought the big bore uh, potential was a lot higher. I, I think you made the right call for what it's worth. Uh, but, but so you're coming back to an arrow gun. We're coming back to arrow guns. Which is very cool. You know, and we're going to do the same thing to the arrow guns that we did to the Texan. We will start out with a model and then we will diversify the model, you know, and we will come out with a, a basic rifle that is comparable to the or arrow shooting rifle that's comparable to the other guns that are out there now. But as we kind of differentiate the market, uh, it's like our first model is going to be called the Talon Bolt. Okay. The Talon Bolt will be shortly followed by the Talon Micro Bolt. Okay. So, like, I'm assuming, like, a Talon P-sized gun. And we actually okay. had ver uh, mock-ups of those at the SHOT Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Of the, of the yep. full-size gun and the Micro Bolt. But they didn't have a name at SHOT Show. Didn't have a name at the yeah, SHOT okay. Show. Okay, all right. So, those are going to be finalized. The, the, the Bolt, the full-size Bolt, should be ready here in the next couple of months. Awesome. Okay. You know, All right. you know, and then we will follow up with the micro bolt. You know, and we have another version of the gun going in the other direction that we'll be probably be following shortly after that. Okay. Interesting. So, and then there will be fishing versions of the gun. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. We'll use a proper fiberglass fishing arrow and we'll shoot it at a proper speed so you don't shoot through the fish. Yeah, right. So when, you know, so when it comes out, it'll, it'll work well, you know, and we'll have the capability. These guns will be power adjustable. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So if you want to hunt moose, you can do that. You can take a switch a ring lock cap out and go and go fishing. And it'll Bow be, fishing. and because of what it's based on, it's going to be a really lightweight platform. Yes. Which is uh, not atypical, but it's, it's not super common either in the aero gun world. I mean, a lot of those guns are quite large. Well, the full size gun's gonna be five and a half pounds. Oh, that's sweet. The that's micro awesome. gun will be lighter than that. Nice, okay. So. Very cool. So, so you've given us some nice morsels here to chew on things to come, uh, some of which I'm very excited about. Um, what else can you tell the folks that, that's going on at Air Force and RAW in terms of development? Well, one of the things that I mentioned uh, as far as RAW, is that we're, we, we're having trouble getting up to full production numbers like we'd like to get at. You know, the raw shipping, you know, on a regular basis at this point, uh, we're exporting guns at this point, uh, but there's still other models that we can't get to until we kind of get up to speed with all the demand for the existing HMX 1000. So for the folks that maybe don't know or just came to next. sure the folks that maybe came to raw uh once you guys took over like there was a, a bench model which was a bm uh, with mm -hmm. a bottle bm 500 there's a tm 1000 which is target model 500 very simple naming strategy here there's a standard hm 1000 series and then there's the hmx which is what you guys are producing now. Yeah. Um, so, so what, what, if I'm reading you right, what you're saying is that you're going to get to some of these other models or something new? Well, the other models, basically the other models. Okay. You know, it, it's, it's basically, you know, we're, we're going to, we want to get caught up because of all the interest in 100 yard bench rest. You know, we, we, we can't keep up with HM1000Xs. Sure. You know, but there's still a demand for, for this, the more compact, uh, uh, lower powered gun, you know, especially in Europe. Yep. They want HMs, which is the standard hunting model. Now, Martin's made a, a, a reputation for the, the target models in bench rest. Yep. And he calls them, he, he, they, they, when we bought the company, he had target models, which tended to be field target guns. And he had bench models, which were bench rest guns. Yep. We have dropped the BM because the only difference was the, what he lasered on the side of the receiver. Okay, and the stock was different. And, this, and a yeah. different type sure. of stock. So, but the basic action was the same. Yeah. So now we have a TM, and a TM can be a bench rest gun 
or it can be a field target gun, okay. uh, or it can be uh, any of the any other shooting discipline we we feel we need to move into. You know, we're starting to look a little bit at 10 meter. Interesting. Okay. You know, we've had some interest. We've had some requests from some of the uh, major shooting associations. You know, like why can't we have a U.S. made 10 meter gun? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a proper a U.S. made Olympic level yeah. 10 meter. Yeah, gun. a precision gun, not a sporter yeah, gun. Not a sporter gun. Wow. A precision model. Okay, that's you know, uh, and because of the the refinements in the trigger, you know, that the in the in the from Martin's improvements through the years, sure, and the accuracy level, you know, we can build or we, we have what we need as a starting point to build a 10 meter gun uh, just like the bench rest and uh, field target versions. Okay. So that's something we're as we get to it we're looking at it. You know a lot of the difference in the in the target guns is, is furniture. Yeah. <clears throat> the basic action and, and then the, the power ranges are very similar so you know what we we're trying to what we we want to we want to do because there's not a lot of volume in target guns right and in order to make it the, the the thing viable from a production standpoint we have to satisfy a lot of sub markets yeah and you have to have something kind of to your point that does multiple things out of kind of one mm -hmm. uh, in this case one action that can do multiple things maybe with some minor tweaks and even if you can do it with one action and stock or maybe one action in two stocks or three stocks, mm -hmm. you know, that, that opens up uh, a lot of possibilities. And a lot of it ends up boiling, uh, boiling down to the stock configuration. Sure. You know, and there again, we're looking at some more advanced manufacturing techniques in order to come up with variations in stock configurations that we can do in relatively small quantities at a, at a, and be able to sell them at a reasonable price sure huh. because there are not it's not a large volume market right so we have to find a way to make small volume of parts efficiently so that we can still sell them at a competitive price to the target the target shooting crowd sure depending on which discipline they want to go after yeah there's definitely a demand i mean i see a demand for american made products mm -hmm. in that space for sure uh, and it's one thing that's really at least to my knowledge, especially for the 10 meter crowd, never been attempted, really. There, there's really never been anything available uh, as far as a capability, ability to build a gun at that level in yeah. the United States before. It's, it's like you could purely dominated by the Germans and the Austrians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, mm -hmm. so that's an interesting, did not see that one coming. Mm -hmm. Did not see that one coming, folks. So that, that's, that's actually really cool. I'm excited to see what comes of that. Wow, okay. So John, before we wrap up, I do have a question uh, that you kind of started talking about and then we got into the history of the company or you know, and how, how the guns have developed. Um, so whatever happened to this full auto BB gun thing? The full auto BB gun thing, when, when I brought the, the uh, single shot gun home to kind of start studying it and deciding how I was going to approach it. I actually set the prototyping thing, elements and stuff like that to the side, and I haven't picked it up since. Now, I've seen some of this stuff, folks. Uh, John is an avid, avid air gun collector. This man has a lot of cool stuff. Uh, if you remember the, the videos we filmed with Tom Gaylord, that's John's man cave. Uh, and if you look closely, some of the guns on the wall are very, very unique full auto uh, BB guns. Yep. Uh, I've, I, since I didn't get around to building full auto air guns yet, I've been collecting them. You the bought years. everything you I could. I keep buying everything I can find yes. as, a, as a reference piece uh, with the idea that possibly someday we may pick it back up again and I love take that. another run at it. I love that. So it's not dead. Nothing's ever it's dead. It's not dead. You know. I don't know, you know, Air Gun Digest. There's been, what, three of them now? Magazines? The, the original Air Gun Digest. Yeah. That uh, Jess Galan did the first one. Okay. And then Robert Beeman did the second yeah, two, yeah. I believe. Yeah. 
Well, in that very first edition Air Gun Digest, Jess Galan had a full auto pellet gun that he did an article on. That pellet gun is in that man cave up on that wall. I don't know if you ever noticed it or not. <laughs> but that, there are some, hist what, what I would call from an air gun perspective, historical pieces in there. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that. I mean, this, this man's got McGlashins, like you've got all the toys. Yeah, you know, we, it's... we actually bought out the Feltman, the original Feltman yeah, yeah, yeah. arcade gun company. That's so cool. You know, that, that. We're talking about like the, the, the thing at the, the carnival Tommy with the, the Tommy gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's been sitting, it's been sitting up on pallets because we don't have time to mess with it. But one day. Maybe one Maybe. day, you know, we'll break it out. May I hope so, man. That'll be a lot of fun. Well, John, thank you for sitting down with us. I no appreciate problem. it. Thank you for uh, not only the history, but also some insight into what is uh, in the future mm -hmm. for Air Force and RAW. It's awesome to see an American manufacturer thriving uh, and, and looking to push forward as well. So hopefully you all have enjoyed it today. If you did, throw us a like down below. Uh, don't forget to comment. Let me know what you're excited about so we know what to review when these guys come out with it. Uh, and don't forget to uh, subscribe as always. We appreciate it a ton and we will see you next time oh i have something else i want to say hit me since this is going on youtube yes. people make all those little comments down at the bottom yeah uh we've been accused a, a lot of times of that we don't care about what people want and and that we we go off on, a, on our own directions and and we don't listen to what the what customers re are really after yeah and that's really not the case you know, the thing is that, you know, through the years, we've been a, a, a very small company and there's only so much we can do with the resources we have. Well, the situations are a little better now. There's more things we can do. There's more things we want to be able to do. So we are really interested in comments that you make after this video, because I'm going to be looking very closely to see, if, you know, what do you want? You know, that's, yeah, we want, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do us any good to build what we like because we're not buying them. You know, it depends on what the public wants. That's a very good point. So you all heard it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. You need to comment down below and let Air Force know uh, and Raw know, respectively, obviously, one company, but two brands, what you're interested in seeing. Did anything John say tickle your fancy? Are you going to be buying an aero gun? Do you waiting for a 10 meter Raw? What do you want to see? Do you want them to bring back the full auto BB gun concept? I do. Uh, whatever you guys want, let us know down in the comments. Uh, it goes to show that these manufacturers do really read this stuff. They are paying attention uh, and they want to know what you guys think. Uh, I want to know what you guys think. It helps everybody. So do your job. Comment down below. That's all we ask.